but off Jupiter's live. I will just keep an eye on it. So, yeah. Uh, well, hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> My name. <laughs> I love you, Pamela. <laughs> Pamela is the consummate, consummate professional. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for February 10th, 2003. There's Jupiter! Right there! There it is. There it is. <laughs> Oh, there it goes. Oh. We're having cloud problems today. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is it was the snow apocalypse, isn't it? I'm gonna meme that. East Coast. Or... God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, virtual Star Party, February 10th, 2013. Joining me tonight with telescopes. We've got actually only three telescopes tonight. <laughs> there's, there's Jupiter! There it is. There it is. Jupiter's okay. back. There's Jupiter. Okay. <laughs> Three and a half telescopes. <laughs> should, we, should we wait for Nicole to get it to get it ahead? Or find the mute button. Should, should we mute, mute Nicole? Myself? Should we hide her? All right. Here, I'll, I'll mute her. Okay, I love you, Nicole. Be, I really do. That, that would be best. Okay. So, <laughs> so tonight, tonight, we have three telescopes. Two and a half telescopes, really. So, so the first uh, telescope is David Dickinson, who is in Florida, and he showing us this uh, patchy view of, of Jupiter. And so you can just imagine what the skies are looking like right now. David's saying it's about 95% cumulus clouds drifting by. So Jupiter's going to come back and forth over the course of this evening. And so what I'm going to do is every time I see it, I'm just going to switch to it and we'll just watch it. And then when it fades away... In oh, what's that, David? Minutes, it should, in a few minutes, it should be stable here. It looks okay. like this, this cloud band patch is passing over. You can see like a big open patch so, going on. All right. The whole um, sky is on a conveyor belt here tonight. So. Okay, yeah. So, like I said, we'll just I'll just keep watching, and when I see a clear Jupiter, I'll just switch back to it, and okay. uh, and we'll, we'll we'll go from there. Uh, so joining us as well, we've got Bill McLaughlin, who is in Oregon. And uh, he was queuing up the, uh, I think you're doing Correct. the Richard Nebula, right? Yeah, okay. Um, and then we've also got, uh, we got Stuart Foreman, who's in the San Francisco area, and he's going to show us this beautiful view of the Orion Nebula Hello. that he started with. But, but I'm going to go back to the Jupiter right now while we have it. Um, so joining us as well, we've got, uh, we've got Nicole, <laughs> Nicole, Nicole Gallucci. Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Who wow, is, uh, you can't even say my name now. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Dr. Nicole Yay. Gallucci, uh, a.k.a. the Noisy Astronomer. We've got Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy Cast. We've got Scott Lewis. Hi, everyone. And we've got Dr. Thad Zabo, back from Joshua Tree, with stories to tell. Hello. And we've uh, we've got Gary Ganella, who is joining us for color commentary this week, and maybe he's going to show us some pictures. Uh, Gary uh, Gary's cloud out as well. So, uh, yeah, it is the snowpocalypse, right, on the East Coast. So all of our East Coast astronomers are enjoying, uh, what, 50? Shoveling? Shoveling yeah. 30 <laughs> inches of snow. You know how long it's been since I've seen snow? Shut up. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that snow all week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hate snow. snow. Dislike. <laughs> Dislike. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's let's just start with the telescopes while we uh, while we have them. So I'm going to start with Bill's view here of the Witch Head Nebula. Look at that. So where's the Witch Head? That is in, uh, I'm trying to think, it's probably it's fairly south. I think it's, um, Herodonis? No. It's near Rigel, isn't it? Yeah, I think it might be. It's pretty yeah, low. very near Rigel. Yeah, so it's right near Rigel. And what kind About of a, 900 what kind of, light years away. And what kind of a nebula is it? That I would have to defer to the experts. I'm. <laughs> I believe we bought three PhD astronomers here tonight. So why don't we? Uh, uh, refl well, it's blue, so it's probably a reflection nebula. Yeah, it, it is a reflection yep. nebula. There is one heck of a bright star near it, um, and so yeah, basically light comes from the side, hits the cloud, and the blue light gets scattered such that the blue light comes out the side and the red light gets transmitted through. So whenever you see blue, that means the star is over here and the light's coming through and then going, getting scattered out towards us. This is the exact same principle behind why the sky is blue. Nebula blue, sky blue, exact same thing. So is this going to turn into stars at some point or is it the, you know, is it just remnants of stars? Is it... 
exploded stars? It, it's a pretty big nebula. I, I I don't know if if it's going to spontaneously become stars anytime soon, but it has that structure to it. And then the witch's head. Do we? Where's the witch's head? This is another one of those episodes we're all going to be going like this. But... I think oh. there's like a nose that's kind of like. Yeah, I think it's upside yeah, down so right now. It, it, it's upside down. You have to reverse it, and then you can see the curvy chin coming out, and I then the nose. I, I'm just waiting for Nicole to go, I yeah. see it! I like the way and... Nicole was doing it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's my professional opinion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there, there it is. There. Now it's easy to see. You can see oh, the eye, the open I'm mouth. Yeah. In the darkness. Okay. Yeah. Oh, she's screaming. She's like, I'm going to get you! <laughs> <laughs> or it looks like the, you know, the, the Mac the Knife from those uh, McDonald's commercials. Like that moon face guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow, I haven't thought about that yeah. guy. That was like a gazillion years ago. I know. I was, I was <laughs> way out on a limb there, but I'm glad you guys are backing me up. Yeah. <laughs> Early yeah. 80s. Yeah, I know. I know. That, I just dated myself. Yeah, um, we weren't born yet. I, no, I remember <laughs> it. <laughs> it wasn't that early 80s. Cause yeah. it was, I want to say it was like 86 or so. Yeah. We were yeah, mid-80s. Mid mid -80s, mid -80s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to Jupiter. Because it's because still Jupiter. there. I know. And we're going to savor this precious time with Jupiter. Wouldn't moving um, to Jupiter take about 40 minutes, though, even at the speed of light? Well, yes. We can oh, do it. Oh, 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 move to the view of Jupiter. All oh, right, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> was that, was that, was that an astronomy joke? Yeah. Was a yes. Excuse me while I go now, and become infinitely massive and go to the speed of light. So have we done it again? Have we missed the Great Red Spot? Yes, we have. I took no. a look on, uh, on Sky and Telescope, and it is turned exactly uh, backwards uh, 180 degrees from us uh. right now. So does that confirm our theory that we are in some kind of resonance <laughs> with think, the uh, Great Red Spot? I think we yes. are. Yes. Is it a 10-hour, 11-hour rotation? It's, a, it's about a 10-hour rotation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. About, about, we should About 10. Yeah. Hmm. It, what 168 so, hours in a week? 168 hours in a week. So I mean, yeah. I mean, there, there should be a, a we're gonna two have hour to schedule program. this. You know this, right? We're, but but I, the problem is, is going to do the math. Be, yeah. <laughs> And we're going to schedule, we'll, we'll be able to see this. I know it. And then it'll be cloudy. And then it'll be cloudy. And we'll be pissed. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in, in a few months, Jupiter's going to be behind the sun. So by the time it's visible, we won't see it. Right. That will be problematic. Yeah. But, but then we'll have Saturn. Yeah. It's mm. true. Saturn's actually the, the open, open hunting season on Saturn has started. I, I know that Mike Phillips is actively trying to engage it. Mm. And uh, one of the awesome things is, as the south pole of Saturn points more and more towards us, uh, some of the amateurs are actually starting to be able to image the hexagon oh, on Saturn's I saw south that. pole. I saw that. Yeah, isn't that amazing? So, kudos to all you guys out there getting these amazing images. And if you haven't tried, it's easier if you start, well, stretching out in the IR bands and uh, seeing what you can capture with some good filters. And Mike, I've been sort of had a chance to finally meet Mike at the yeah. uh, at the Scion Online. Yeah, last, N last week. Nicole, you and I all did. Yeah, it was fabulous. Yeah, it, was, it was fantastic to finally to finally meet, and I look forward to meeting the rest of the astronomers. Um, but Mike and I were were scheming and sort of trying to figure out what kinds of ways we could take things to the next level. So I know being able to like view the the hexagon on Saturn and a lot of this stuff. He's got he's yeah. got big plans. <clears throat> Yeah, he's he's and he's moving into now doing a lot of this deep sky stuff too. He is he's yeah, relentless. He's, he's yeah, he's getting very versatile. I mean, last, yeah, last week he was using his his uh, DSLR for the first time in the Hangout too, and you know, yeah. for for not really doing all that much, we were able to pull up some a lot of great stuff. So yeah. I don't know what type of ninja work he's doing over there, but keep it up, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're. Right, well, we're... I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move to Stuart's view because I know he's probably got another image queued up after this. So this is the. Oh, look at that! It's the Orion Nebula. This is the Orion Nebula, and we've shown this before, but um, I'll let Pamela and Thad tell about what it is. But I rather like this image. This was a two-minute. Um, image at uh, ISO 1600 with a modified uh, Canon, and it just shows what you can do with a refurbished camera that you know you put a little time into, and you can see a lot of cool nebulosity. Yeah, I mean one of these image, one of these cameras. This is probably what a four or five year old camera. You can pick it up on eBay for Astromart. Yeah, hundred dollars, yeah. hundred and fifty dollars. 
Yeah, it's um, on Craigslist. Mm-hmm. No. Probably. Yeah, well, I don't know. But <laughs> I, got, I got I got actually got mine refurbished from B and H Photo, but the um, but you can get them in a lot of different places. For T one. Yeah. Um, they were they were selling T threes T threes not T three I but T threes for two ninety nine at my local electronics store. Yeah, this was a while ago, but yeah, yeah. These, I mean they're they're just they're just. You know, coming down in price. Yeah, but is that right. real money or Canadian money? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's worth more than American money. money now. No, <laughs> but close. <laughs> no, it's Canadian dollars higher than the U.S. dollar right now. Not today, but... according to the PayPal order I made. Oh, okay. Oh. okay. No, they just they, they zing you they zing you both ways on that. So, but you don't have pennies anymore, though. No, we don't. Yeah, we've can't That's we've wild. gotten rid of the penny oh, as of. Like but going ago. back to the astronomy, <laughs> there's <laughs> copper in space. <laughs> Anyways, red nebula, unlike the witch's head that we just saw, this red nebula is red because of the light transmitting through the nebula. This is a star-forming region. This is one of the great ones in the sky. Well, this is one very small part of the Great Orion Nebula. And in the southern hemisphere, people look at Eta Carini all the time, and that's just one small fact star surrounded by nebulosity within the Great Korean Nebula. By comparing these two different star forming regions, we're really getting a good picture on early star forming early star formation within clusters. And it, it looks like there's like another piece of nebulosity over on the left hand side of this image. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's part of the Running Man nebula, although the Running Man is kind of a, a dark area kind of imposed on that uh, reflection nebula. We were coming up with other names for it, uh, I guess, in the Star Party last week. I don't know if we should go back into that again at all. But, um, Muck Man? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so, I mean, you know, any time where you have the uh, hydrogen present that, that is emitting light, um, you may also have dust present or dark molecular clouds, so you often see these all in combination um, in the sky. So. But, but rather than the running man, it definitely is that old picture, Bigfoot mid-stride. <laughs> Sasquatch Nebula. Yeah. Yes. Patterson-Gimlin film? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and Gary, what have you put up here? Well, just something kind of a little bit of fun. This is the one I captured by accident. Whoa! This, this is, I was going after this oh. nebula, and this is proof there's intergalactic war. The people <laughs> on this star are shooting this star. You can see it exploding here, and they're passing that one, and they're shooting this one, and that's exploding. So you now see laser <laughs> fights stars between stars. <laughs> yeah, now, in all truthfulness, it's an airplane. Yeah. Yes. And this is just where the, the, the light blinks. But are they space where, airplanes? Yes, the lights space. and the, the wingtips blink. Oh, oh that's so it's cool. Not a, not a fluke that it yeah. went through all those stars. It's actually blinking lights on the airplane. Yeah, yeah. I see. But intergalactic war sounds better. <laughs> Much better. Yeah. And worse, all at the same time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, I'm going to move back so to... So what's going on? So Bill's what, what got one, too. An image? The the little fuzzy yeah uh, what was that little fuzzy back here that's oh. NGC seven zero two three that's the Iris Nebula oh thank you I was looking it up and I couldn't remember what it was uh, okay because <laughs> it looks like it's surrounded by dust too like the stars yes. in the background are 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 blotted out yeah. yes yeah I think I've got a better shot of that I'll take a look here cool cool what was it uh, seventy three zero two uh seventy twenty three seventy twenty three yeah oh so I moved over to Bill's picture now. And and he's also got a uh, galactic war. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I, you know that it was so vertical. I thought there was something That's... wrong with the camera, but oh, uh, yeah. That's not a hot column. No, it's not. It's actually a satellite. I, huh. The the next image doesn't show it. And if you look, it's just a little bit tilted. Not much. It's a baby cool. rocket. Worried me for a second, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. you had you had a bad uh, pixel column in your camera. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would hope not. Not in a DSLR. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and what is the object? That is IC405, the Flaming Star Nebula. And, and down to the left is an open cluster, isn't it? Exactly. Oh, that's a really that's nice Alpha wide Epsilon field of view. or Riga in the middle that's illuminating oh. the blue portion. Yeah. <laughs> and, th and that's a star that underwent a very large um, eclipse. What was it? 2009, 2010? Yeah. Right, right. And that was... Uh, Captured very well by the Chara array on top of Mount Wilson. Right. So, I love that. You, I love you can see the colors of the stars in the center. Yeah. You can actually yeah. get the temperature differences. 
which was for some reason the coolest thing ever I learned when I was in seventh grade was that stars come in different colors and there's different temperatures and oh my gosh, black body radiation. I don't think they called it that then, but it really helps having that color view of these mm -hmm. of these star clusters. I mean you really just see those different yeah. colors of stars in the clusters. I, I really like it. Fantastic. Well, we've still got some Jupiter happening, so I'm going to move to that. Oh, I've got some moons. I've got the moons in there, too. Yeah, I managed to adjust the exposure, so hey. you kind of got a good balance between the two. Uh, the only one in that view is uh, missing of the Galilean moons is Ganymede. Yep. So you can see the three moons there, yeah. Yeah, they're forming a triangle, Callisto, Io, and uh, Europa. Wow. Not too different from how they looked last night. Kind of strange. So I'm guessing they would have moved okay. kind of in, in in sync pretty well then. Or maybe maybe it was that Io and Europa were coming from one side of Callisto, and now they've kind of come to the other side of it. You can't really see what I'm doing with my fingers because they moved out of the they field of view. They might have flipped places, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind, of, kind of a flip. But they were forming a nice little triangle last night as well. So Io moves pretty quick. Yes. Mm -hmm. Being yes. the closest. 1.77 yeah. days for... And they have a resonance, right? Like the, the various moons have resonance with yes. each other. Right. Yeah, it's I wrote a... an article in Lightspeed Magazine a couple of years ago about this, where the neat thing to think about is they named most of these moons after the mistresses of Jupiter. So the mistresses of Jupiter are chasing one another around the planet. <laughs> That's awesome. Also, they got to 55 of them before they ran out of names. So <laughs> that's a Jupiter busy... was a busy boy. Yes. <laughs> and Gary, you've posted another another picture here. Oh that's wow, hours. that's uh, that's one I took in uh, in for some reason ah. I'm blinking again. That's, that's in the so uh, hydrogen, alpha, oxygen, and sulfur. That's, that's absolutely ridiculous. beautiful. So just to be clear, Gary's Gary's not showing live pictures because he's clouded out, but. And the blinking is why I'm getting penalty by blinking or something. Here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you see the images blink, then you know it's not live. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it is blinking. Huh. That's a weird new feature. So that, that's the one that was in the Galactic War. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, Gary, when I get tired of dragging my scope out to the desert, I'm going to have to ask you about narrowband so, okay. and how to do it properly. Well, so. you're welcome to come up here and play if you want to. All right. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move to the blue snowball from Stuart. Actually, this is the Eskimo Nebula. Um, not it's it sort of looks like the blue snowball, doesn't it? But yeah, um, yeah. The it doesn't have a lot of definition because it's so small. And I have a kind of a wide field uh, telescope, but you can kind of get a sense of the blueness of it. Yeah. And, um, uh, the difference between them is that the the Eskimo has a little white central core. The blue snowball does not. Mm. Um, and you know, if you look at Hubble pictures of it, obviously it's a lot. You know, you can see a lot more definition. But they 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 are similar, but they they do look uh, uh, very different when you blow them up. Yeah, yeah. We just don't happen to have Hubble handy. <laughs> Sadly, no, we don't. Cool. Freddie's joining us. Hi, hey, Freddie. Oh, oh, you're muted, Freddie. You're muted when you join. <laughs> 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 All right. We'll let him get his uh, his mute going. And Stuart, so you just updated to something else. Uh, yeah, this is M35, and... Um, uh, I like it because you can see a second cluster yeah. up, up and mm -hmm. to the right, which is completely yeah. unrelated, according to my reading. And I'm, I'm already off they're that screen, so I can't. Different distances. Yeah, they're different distances. They're they're not related to each other at all. But it's but it's neat. You can see you know, two clusters in one, and it's not the double cluster, which right. is on the other side of the sky for me right now. Right, and I mean this is this cluster is very near where the the sun is on uh, on June 21st on summer solstice for the the northern hemisphere. So this is just about where the, the sun is on that date. And the Lagoon Nebula, strangely enough, is right about where the, the sun is at uh, winter solstice. So, You know the most wonderful factoids. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. You can just pull these out. And again, you can kind of see the color differences in the stars. And, yeah. and when you have a cluster like this, 
uh, when you have an open cluster, um, you know all of these stars are pretty much born together. You can uh, use use the uh, what the the color the colors and magnitudes of the stars. You can graph them and actually figure out how old the cluster is um, by looking at these looking at the, the stars. Yeah. So I forgot to mention uh, that you can ask us any questions or comments or give us feedback if you want. Uh, you can do that on the event page if you're watching this on Google+. Uh, you can also post any comments on Twitter. Just use the hashtag Star Party. Or you can uh, make your comment on YouTube, and we should get it there as well. So, uh, so BTL743, we are reading the YouTube comments. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're and just... Twitter and everything else. We're all over yeah. the place. Yeah, we're all over, yeah. <clears throat> And also, uh, to that commenter, there's not much point in trying to track down Ison right now. Yeah. So, but just wait till November. Well, Is maybe, maybe, maybe wait till maybe. November. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, but we are, we, we are going to have a nice comment, comment, I can't say the word now, a nice blob of ice with an ionized <laughs> tail. Uh, That's easier. Yeah. Much in, easier. in a few weeks, and on March twelfth, it's actually going to be very nice because it and a very thin crescent moon are going to be near one another on the sky. So while I can remember all those details, I can't remember what its name is. So comet lemon. Pan stars. And then pan, pan stars. Okay. Pan stars. Yeah. 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 Pan stars. Yeah. Yeah. So and March so, March twelfth is the night I'm going to be out there with my my cameras. Yeah, and we've actually got a, a couple of articles coming out on Universe Today all about this. We got, I mean, this is the year of the comets. We've got a bunch of really great bright comets, and then culminating ideally in Comet Ison by the end of the year. So yeah. Well, actually, yeah. aren't we all going to be at South by Southwest for that with our star parties? For the March one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So hopefully we'll be able Don't to show we get off that comet. Back by the twelfth. Yes. Okay. So it's the week before. It, it starts okay. to show up in in northern hemisphere skies about the the eighth or ninth. I'm okay. uh, I'm already planning another trip to the desert to try and photograph it. So it's not going to be in the east or in the west. In the west, just after sunset, oh, and it's going to slide north along the horizon for that following week. So I'm also I talked to my uh, astronomy club members who I was out in the desert with last night, saying you know we got to have the binoculars and the scopes ready to go that week, so that way. Yeah. We can can show it to anybody on campus who who wants to have a look because it, it will be well placed for yeah. um, northern hemisphere observers. And it's going to be just it's going to be just shy of uh, or even like naked eye visible, right? No, it's going to be magnitude. Uh, but it's forecast between be around magnitude zero, oh. so it would be about mm. as bright as say Vega. Mercury. Yeah, Vega or um, Mercury or Mars in the in the west right now. Is is so. that surface brightness or yeah. total brightness? Is they um, they deceive you sometimes with those numbers? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure if that's an integrated value or if that's a if that's what they expect the nucleus to be. Someone posted a story that it was going to be as bright as the Big Dipper, but I didn't really understand that. I, I So what, what I understood that to mean was the nucleus of the comet was going to be as bright as the individual stars in the Big Dipper typically oh. are as its brightness varies. Right, and that's the magnitude zero you were saying. So well, the big Big Dipper stars are around magnitude two, so I guess because it's going to be yeah. so close to sunset, grab a pair of binoculars. Yeah. Wait until the sun sets. Don't, yeah, don't look at the sun sets. But yeah. after the sunset, then just scan along the western horizon, about like one one fist's worth up from uh, at arm's length. It's about ten degrees, and uh, within that that range from the horizon, you should be able to pick it up. Have you seen the uh, the video that um, that Paul Stewart did on Oh on my the gosh, comet? that's fabulous. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if someone can dig that up. But uh, yeah. but yeah, it's just beautiful. It's, it's beautiful time lapse. This it's this beautiful green comet, Comet Lemon, right now. But it's only visible in the southern hemisphere. So mm -hmm. Paul Stewart is in New Zealand. That's the upside down astronomer. And his, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's just good, beautiful. And his images of the sun. I, I highly recommend I you follow him on Google Plus. He's just amazing. Yeah, yeah um, I've got it here. Let me pop it up in New Zealand. In fact, I think okay. I'm just going to. I've we're got it too. Do you? Oh, okay, let's you see. Go, you go go for it. Who, who, wherever I see the Im the image first is where I'm going to. So. Oh, I stopped, so it's all. Oh, pamphlet. did you? Okay, let's, let's pamphlet, <laughs> then. Yeah, here we go. Check this out. Look at that. And I'll embiggen it once I find the corner of the window. Yeah, there we go. Comet Liz Lemon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deal breaker, astronomers. <laughs> That did not work as anticipated. If you hold your mouse over it, it'll it'll make it bigger. Hold your mouse that, over the actual yeah. There, that the little, was the button yeah. I couldn't find. Thank yeah. you. 
That didn't work. That didn't work. Oh, no. well, you full screened it. But I think people saw the uh, the comet moving. So that was that's that's what the our friends in the southern hemisphere are seeing right now. This really is like I said. This is the year of the comets. I've, I'm calling it now. Year of the comets. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to move to Bill's view. Oh, there we go. Okay, Pamela's got it. Nope, Scott's got it. Oh, I'm sorry, Pamela. Scott. Did it's it. all right. Wow. Scott did a better job than I did. Look at that. But you see the the green, that That's beautiful green, green color to it. Yeah. yeah. Hydrogen cyanide. And this is the thing that kind of freaks cyanide. people out sometimes with with comets coming past. It's like, oh, it's cyanogen gas. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really, really, really thin. Yeah, that that, that was um, an early early 20th century pass of Halley's comet. It was in the newspapers, and they were selling anti cyanide pills. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a big deal. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, so someone wants to uh, on YouTube. Someone asked if we can explain how the brightness scale works. <sighs> Carefully, kill it. Slowly. No, no, so, so <laughs> it, it all goes back to uh, people not realizing there were things fainter than what you can see with your eyes, and Things and being so. Hipparchus? Well, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so it started off with zero is the absolute brightest. So just like you might say number one is the best, they said zero is the brightest. And then six is the faintest a normal person. Um, Barbara, you know I'm the one looking at you right now who can see down to seven. She, there's an insane, awesome woman with insane eyes down in Texas. You can see seven. Normal humans see fair. to six. Yeah. <laughs> so from zero to six was the original scale used. Um, Vega is where we've pinned our scale system to today, where it's set to be zero until they readjust various yeah, yeah, yeah. filter systems. Um, but but over time, as we've developed optics and we've begun to see things that are fainter and fainter and fainter, um, we've added more and more numbers. And there's a mathematical relationship that uh, relays the magnitude of an object, and it's related to the log of how much the number of photons that we're capturing increases. So it's a logarithmic scale, the same way our eyes are a logarithmic scale, because the two were originally uh, melded one to the other. Now, the confusing thing when you're trying to look up what you want to look at with your telescope is when you're looking at extended objects, they can quote two different numbers to you. They can quote the surface brightness, which is the number of magnitudes per arc second on the sky. So one star's size worth of a galaxy is how bright. The other number that they can quote to you is the integrated brightness of that galaxy. Now the problem with this is if you're looking at a really big galaxy like Andromeda, it's, it spreads out three moon widths across the sky. Well, you add all that light together, you get a very small number. That's the tricky part about astronomy is the lower the number, the brighter the object. But we don't actually see all that brightness. Its surface brightness is extremely low except in the core where you can begin to see it with your naked eye. So it's a whole lot of confusion and a lot of times you'll even see the astronomers going, wait, okay, higher number, fainter object and, 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 and we logarithmic. get ourselves. <laughs> yes. yes. Because our ears and eyes are logarithmic and Hipparchus used his eyes to make these bins. Yeah. yeah. We have to deal with the backward messed up. Everyone should use Janskis. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, you just jargon all over this hangout. Yeah, Bill, can you go back to that uh, that image that you had before? I want to. I wanted. I was going to go to that. Yeah, that's image. what I have. I think that's what I have up now, right? You're black now. I'm black, really. Yeah. You, let me you let are. me check it again here. Come to nothing. No, Jupiter. There we go. There we go. All right, we're losing Jupiter, so I'm going to move yeah. to Bill's view. Uh, that is the Cone and Foxfur Nebula. Mm. The cone and fox for nebula. I don't the cone, know. The cone is actually down. If you can see my cursor, it's right down in here. It's the dark part, a dark part of the nebula. I'll show you a better view later. Oh. And then the fox fur is kind of up here. It is, uh, let me find the object. Um, it's in uh, Monoceros. Yeah, it's, it's in Monoceros, uh, H2 NGC. region mostly, but there's some blue reflection in there too. Uh, I think it says NGC 20, 2264. 2700 light years. Gary, you've done the cone nebula before, I'm pretty sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. Also and known as the Christmas tree cluster. Yep. Exactly. 
Um, let me give you a better view here of it uh, from a long t uh, exposure. Am I right that you have a really huge field of view? Yeah, yeah, it's a 500 millimeter basically on a, on with a okay. um, yeah, not as big as Gary's. If it's no, 500 millimeter, it is. Yeah. Gary's bigger. No, yeah, I'm, about, a, I'm about 700. Yeah, oh. yeah, you're several degrees across, aren't you, Bill? Yeah, yeah. And here's a here's a four hour hydrogen alpha of That's the same stunning. area. You can see the wow. It's really That's gorgeous. That's absolutely stunning. Hmm. What? You can see why they call it fox fur because it looks kind of like fur if you use your imagination up here. Yeah. But is the cone that that, that <laughs> cone is this part, <laughs> that right. part down in the down near the bottom, right? Exactly. Wow. Which, yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, it looks the... like a star is like plowing through some kind of interstellar well, medium, right? So, oh, so I think it's just darker and denser, and that's where the star formation is happening, and it's blocking out. What's going on behind it? Yeah. Wow. But yeah, it does look like it's plowing. But Scott's you can got see... a close up of the cone right now. Yeah. Okay, that's the one I'm used to seeing. <laughs> so beady. That's Hubble. That was me about three seconds ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Just burn I, it I, out. I think you've got the same cloudy skies that Gary does. I do, okay. but my, my cell phone's so cool that it will <laughs> Right. All right, I'm going to move to... Gary's going to show us another picture here. Gary, what, what's this a picture of? Um, this is just something that, um, that I put together so people can see what you can actually do. This is my Canon camera with a 30-millimeter lens, and I just got that little cheap tracking mount from Orion. And this is a 20-minute exposure for my backyard, and this is the North American Nebula. Here's oh. the Pelican. Now, my normal field of view with my scope is about this square yeah. that I'm marking out here. Wow. And you can see all the nebulosity. So this is a huge swath of sky. And this is just a standard 30-millimeter yeah. lens. Wow. Is that how many degrees across is this? Uh, I'd like have to calculate. 20. Yeah, it's got to oh, yeah. be 20. So that's two fists worth at arm's length, everybody. Yes. That's, that's yeah. a big chunk of sky. Yeah, because, I mean, Deneb's in there, Seder's in there, it looks like the butterfly complex near Gamma Cygni's in there, the Crescent would be in there. Jeez. Yeah, okay, that's this enormous. is amazing. Yeah. Yes. And, so, and so how did you take this picture? Um, this is my Canon 20DA, which is um, mm -hmm. synthesized to hydrogen, and I've got the, um, the pollution filter that comes out of Germany. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, but that's made specifically for the Canon cameras. And I just got the, Orion has a little mount that's designed for an SLR camera, and it's got a little motor that tracks, and you don't have to worry about accuracy because it's such a wide field of view. And this is, um, I think it was 10 two-minute photos that I stacked together, but just set it out in the backyard, pointed that's part of the sky, and took the shots. But, I mean, you could attach the camera to your, to your mount, right? I can telescope mount, like just bolt onto the side of your telescope, or yeah. The reason I got this is is when I travel and don't want to take a big scope with me, I just can set this up and get some nice yeah. wide field sky views. That's great. I am now looking for that mount to put it on my wish list. <laughs> well, yeah, it's if not you don't, very if expensive. You don't, if you don't me asking, yeah, what would a mount like this run? I think it's one hundred and forty dollars or something. It wasn't hmm. much at all. That's and it's... less than a lens. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Orion's got some great stuff. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Okay. So, so in other words, it's like a it's like a regular tripod, but it's designed to track the sky a little bit. Yeah, it's just and got a little motor and a, a battery motor. pack. Right. You turn it on and it tracks the sky. And then you put the and you attach your DSLR to it, just like a tripod. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I want I want one of those too. That's, yeah. I'm gonna get one. Looking That's, for the okay, link. People are asking for the link. I, I, I'm looking. I'm looking. Yeah, that would be so. that would be great for the eclipse <laughs> coming up in 2017. But, oh, uh, that's the one that comes half hour away from our house. It comes right directly over my observatory. We have wow. we have awesome. one minute of totality here. Really? Wow. Uh, yeah. Cool. We're, we're gonna still have to drive, but not far. I mean. I'm driving to your place, actually, Bill. I think is the plan. The coolest thing, the, actually, the the Oregon Star Party is even closer to the center line. It's about a minute and a half out of the two of totality, and it's the same weekend. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. With the Star the... Party, it's the standard site where they always have it. 
Uh, um, Darth Killer just said, hey guys, is it possible for you to broadcast in high D? Uh, no, it is not possible. Unfortunately, this is the tool that Google has made available. <laughs> Ask Google. Yeah, ask Google, yeah. We will do yeah. it. Yeah, we've, we, we see high def inside the Hangout, but unfortunately it doesn't broadcast out. It only broadcasts out at 480p. But, oh, I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, yeah, that's why it looks so nice inside the inside yeah, the hangout. Well, I'm doing screen caps and shoving them into the hangout. Yeah, yeah. The, I noticed uh, looking back at the broadcast, it looks markedly different. It uh, does, yeah. So unfortunately, that's as good as as Google's technology makes it. And so, our objective with all the people ask me this kind of stuff all the time, which is we just want to get really kind of comfortable and good and practice with doing all the stuff. I know Google can do this. It's just a matter of time. I think yeah. it's more of a bandwidth issue than anything else. It's just that uh, to, I, to broadcast simultaneous no. HD from up to ten sources, I think uh, would just cause they a do lot it of with you with YouTube Live, and they did it with the um, uh, with the presidential hangout, and that yeah. must have been going out to hundreds of thousands of people. Right. You know, you look at things like when they did the live uh, the live jump from uh, the you know the Red Bull jump. Uh, that was like 12 million people or something, and that was high def live. So no, they can do it. They and we don't all need to be high def. They don't need to be right. ugly mugs and high def. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I think it's just it's just a matter of time, and so you know we're doing the best we can right now. Uh, Fraser, I have some uh, clusters for you here. Just if you want some live images, I'm ready. Okay, so this is M37, and and I'll move to the next one, which is this is the pinwheel cluster right there um, not sure why it's called a pinwheel cluster but I it's see kind it. of cool you think that you see a pinwheel you see it actually I, I think I, 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 I think she just, she just <laughs> now wants to just make sure she says she's seen it first I really do it's a little flocculent yeah. a little flocculent um, and I actually have a little galaxy here too which I'll show you a little galaxy a little, you know. a little here I'll pull it up here <laughs> So this is NGC 891. You see it there? Oh, oh yeah. my god! Little guy. Yeah. Well, Ed John spiral in. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a spec right on top of it, but you know. Um, yeah, I see. Ed John spiral. Yeah. And nice uh, dust line. Yeah, and I've actually taken this picture, uh, you know, a, a real one, and um, there's actually 37 galaxies. What we're looking at right now. <laughs> oh wow. wow. But you can only see one of them. But you know, I, I blew it up in in a big thing and 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 counted, spent some time counting them up, and I counted thirty seven smudges. Holy it was like your God. own private Hubble deep field. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Stuart deep. The Stuart field. deep field. Stuart. <laughs> Everyone needs a hobby. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Now, which one are we looking at again, Stuart? This is NGC eight ninety one. Eight ninety one. All right. Thanks. I found the tripod. There you go. Emily found it. Okay. And I think you need to share the link somewhere. I, I'm going to. I'm okay. going to put okay. it up on the event. Yeah, I see it here. Called the so, Orion Adventures in Astrophotography Bundle. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. they already beat you to it, actually. Okay. <laughs> I, I, Thank you, Internet. I, Ron and James. can focus on adding it to my wish list yeah. in front of everybody, apparently. But that's okay. <laughs> Um, Default wish list. Well, I'm going to move over to Bill's view now, which is a, I think, believe that's the rosette. And <gasps> the space battle continues. <laughs> wow. Do you guys live near airports? I Actually, do. we're pretty close Maybe. to under the west coast uh, of air route. Oh, okay. So we do tend to get a lot. Now that they've got area nav, you know, you get them all over the place anyway. I think the other issue is that I mean the rosette right now is pretty near the uh, the meridian. Mm. For, that could be too, yeah. Um, for where, where we are on the west coast, so I know that I have to deal with satellite trails all the time. Anytime an object gets near the meridian, so okay. so just some of the stuff that we put up there floating around seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. So Meh. <laughs> how long an exposure did you have to do for this one, Bill? Uh, two minutes. It's a really, I, I love the way it looks like it has termite grooves yeah. through it. That's my favorite aspect of this one. And that's just dark nebula, well, not nebulosity. That's dark clouds blocking the nebulosity. Why do they have those shape, that, those like almost like snakes worming um, their way through it? it? One way to think about it is you have shock waves that compress the gas. 
and and so you end up with these fronts, just like snow plows end up leaving those, um, well, worms of much thicker snow and ice along the sides of roads. That's beautiful. I'm going to move to David's view because we've still got Jupiter, and look, he's 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 embiggened it. I zoomed in with the camera a little bit, yeah. yeah. You embiggened yeah. the biggest planet in the solar system. Yeah, look at that. Way to go. It looks hey, like and go. that's what we're talking about tomorrow on Astronomy Cast is embiggened Jupiters. <laughs> mm. Failed stars. I've decided the title is Failed Stars. But embiggened Jupiters in would be failed, so yeah, much cooler. Failed, failed stars and embiggened Jupiters. <laughs> I agree with that. I think that's They're too much really inside baseball at this point. They're really fascinating super planets. <laughs> I assume you're talking about brown dwarfs, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For, for the, everyone who's failed planets. Okay. In, the movie, <laughs> in the movie 2010, they managed to collapse and uh, start fusion on Jupiter. Yes. <laughs> you, you put it under a... enough pressure, but it's not going to happen. You have yeah. to add or mass. You, have to you just have to add another 80 mass. Jupiters. That's yeah. all. Red yeah. matter. Yeah. Well, which, red which, matter. Which well, I think I was think great. Do you what... remember when uh, they were going to drop... Um, they're going to drop the uh, Galileo spacecraft into Jupiter, and people were yeah. concerned that it was going to ignite Jupiter into a yeah. star. And, and the way we were describing it, you know, was, yes, if Gal the Galileo spacecraft contains the mass of 80 Jupiters in it, then yes, that's what you'll get. And luckily it was only well, 79 Jupiters, and, 79 and, Jupiters and we and, dodged a bullet. <laughs> and for all of you who are out there going, but I thought that you could have nuclear fusion much smaller. It's sustained nuclear fusion. If you want to get the tritium burning, you can do it at about 13 Jupiter masses. But that's a temporary. That's not much. <laughs> right. yeah. And that's also the cutoff between a, a brown dwarf and a planet, is that 13 yeah. Jupiter masses. Because, yeah, you can get little sparks of tritium going. But Save it for sustained. the show, people. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> We're not on the show. We can talk about it. That's yeah, that's. You jump in. You jump in the after show. If you I'll, need I'll be at lunch. I don't know. So. <laughs> um. <laughs> huge I love all of you. James, Haney, James Haney suggests hugeify instead of embiggen. Because embiggen, you know, it's... We I can say embiggen. Embiggen is all. Embiggen, it's a real word. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to move to Stuart's view again. Yeah, this is actually the center of the rosette. I can't get the rosette um, with this particular setup that I have right now. Um, but this is the middle of it. And so you can kind of see the star cluster in the middle uh, yeah. of the rosette. Ooh. Again with the again with the dust specs, which I gotta get rid of. <laughs> That's okay. what flat fielding is for. Exactly. But I can't flat field in the VSP, so So is there any part of it that you can see? You can't see any of the nebulosity. Um I have to put my focal reducer on and then do a um and then do a stacked image. I'm in I'm in light polluted skies, which makes it a little more difficult. Well yeah. if you wanted you could like zoom in on the termite tracks. Because um, that's about yeah. the right thing for your yeah, field of view. Yeah, you're right. I could. I could. Yeah. So, uh, Okoino O uh, has given the classic question, which is, how dense are nebulae? Uh, would you notice any gas if you flew through one? What would it look like? And I love this sort of question. We get this one all the time. So, if you wanted to sort of fly towards the Orion Nebula, it's the sort of classic example. What What would you see? Space. Space. Not yeah. much of anything at all. Yeah, it's, it's kind of... Not much of anything at all. Go yeah. on. It's huge. So. We discussed last week like how dense the Orion Nebula is, or lack of density. Yeah, lack of density. Lack of density. It's like a, a standard cloud above the planet Earth is thousands of times denser. So the, the reason that we see these as, as thick gas is because they're, in some cases, light years across, and in most cases, at least many, many AUs across. And so when you have solar system upon solar system upon solar system of gas, it, it adds up to, to something thick enough to block light behind it. But, yeah, clouds on Earth do that all the time, and they're way denser and way smaller. Right. What you would see flying through the uh, Orion Nebula is, is where star formation is happening. If you had these globules where the gas had condensed and is starting to form a star, those would be visible, but yeah. they'd be dark because if the star even has, um, is just forming inside of it, it's not giving off visible light yet. So you would you might be able to see a, a dark region blocking the stars from behind it, and that would be one of these uh, these 
star forming globules. Now, now, one of the things that would happen is as you fly deeper and deeper into this cloud of material, the stars that you see would get progressively redder and redder and eventually wink out until you're basically embedded in a great red haze. But you'd have to like fly light years into one of these giant systems before that happened. Oh, and we have a galaxy. Yeah, no, I was sorry. I was gonna, I was gonna, I was watching. David was battling with Jupiter here, so I'm looking there's for the, the other, There's the other moon. There's the animated right there. Yeah. So we've got one over on the right hand side, and then three on the left hand side of the planet. That's fantastic. Okay, well, before we go back to Stuart, I just want to go to see what Bill's got. Okay, just the uh, horse hidden flame uh, nebula. Or oh yeah. Yay! Look at just the, the horse head. head yeah, I, I guess if you have to, Bill. Gorgeous field of could you, view. Could you actually rotate that, Bill? Could you rotate it one clockwise, and then that might make it bigger? Turn, turn your head, Fraser. Well, yeah, yeah, see, everybody does it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to turn the entire internet, no. though. <laughs> oh, okay. That would be so awesome. There. I don't even know how to handle so that. I think, I think that's, that makes it a little bigger and visible for everybody. So look wow. at that little horse head. I love the flame in this one. You have beautiful yeah. contrast on this. Yeah. That's great. I can remember doing that with film and, 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 and desperately trying roll after roll to try to approach anything close to that like 15 years ago, 20 years film. ago. Film? <laughs> that? Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. yeah kudos to you for trying. I mean, man, I was you know, <laughs> describing the process of astrophotography to, to someone last night, and I was just like, I don't know how anybody ever did this with film. And so. guiding. And uh, guiding, yeah. There, did, did you ever read a, uh, a book called, and it's a great book, by the way, called The Perfect Machine. It was about building the Palomar Telescope. And there was a story in there about Richie, the guy, the Richie from Richie Christian. Yeah. And, and apparently Chrétien was, was one of his students, as I understand it. And, or maybe it was one of the other guys, I don't remember, but the story was that the senior astronomer there, and, and he used to sit up in the cage in the cold yeah, the and hand guide these cage. things for hours. So... Uh, he had sent his 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 uh, subordinate astronomer up there, or, you know, maybe graduate student at that time, to do this. And he's he's sat up there, and he's really proud of himself. The fact that he's sat up there in the cold and guided for an hour, and he comes down, and he says, "Okay," he says, "That was really good. Now we'll put a plate in the camera." Oh, <laughs> oh, oh my god! Yeah, but it was only an hour, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But still, I, I know. I've <laughs> so what what gets me is is you're in the dark installing these glass plates, and in order to figure out how to put them in, you can't shine a light on them. They're they're photosensitive, so they would lick them. Oh. And yeah, that's Lighty. not the grossest thing I've heard about prime <laughs> focus gauge observing runs. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to ask. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm my sure mind is imagining other wrong. liquids that might be used in this. Okay, I'm going to yeah. move to Stuart's view. <laughs> oh, that's lovely too. We have oh, although um, we have a couple other questions about nebulae, mm -hmm. even though we're on a galaxy now. Um, yeah. <laughs> that I wanted to point out. Um, Michael asks uh, some of these some nebulae are are measured to have very very high temperatures, and what does that mean for someone flying through it? And although it it has a high temperature because the particles are moving so quickly. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to actually feel heat moving through. It. Yeah, it's, it's a different, different kind of thing. They're, they're, um, yeah, yeah, some nebula are, are, are the particles are moving so fast they're giving off X rays, and so those are the, the hottest, hottest things that we see. With, with the really hot nebulae, there, there's two things you have to take into consideration. Uh, hot water has a whole lot more atoms in contact with your body at any given moment, and more mm -hmm. than that, it also has the, the ability to transfer the heat energy very readily. There's some materials that don't transfer heat readily. Wood is one of them. Um, when you're in a near vacuum, it's not going to readily transfer the heat to you. Yeah. So while you might individually get hit with some um, any rather very fast particle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in general, no heat is transferred to you. You're good. Mm -hmm. And those those clouds of gas that are in the millions of degrees, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah those are the ones that give off X-ray. Yeah. And still, same thing. You could fly through them and yeah. And not. Although you would be bombarded with X-rays. 
it would be bad for your electronics. Yeah. Yes. But but that that scene in both series of Battlestar Galactica where they're going through the super hot, super dense nebulae, that sort of oh, thing doesn't God. happen. Oh, God. That's the one time Kevin Gray is here. Kevin. But, but it, admittedly, it was a reenactment of what happened in the original series when right. they were trying to get to Capricorn. To... And Star Trek does it all the time. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. It's dense nebulae where they're like dodging clouds and it never does work that way. Yeah. Carillon. That's the name of the planet on the other side. They're trying to get to Carillon. That was way too nerdy. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was just nerdy enough. <laughs> no. So it's uh, it's eight o'clock now. So I think we'll go for another five minutes or so, and then I think we should start to wrap it up and let people go watch the Grammys. Is that tonight? Uh, it's it is. Also, the over. premiere of The Walking Dead. That's the more important. <gasps> oh, really? See you later. <laughs> Bye. Oh, right. I don't have television. I, I did oh, right. see somebody's question here about um, wondering what the Milky Way would look like from another galaxy, and this was one I shot last night. Can I can I bring up my yeah. picture from last night? Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. of your two pictures that you took. One last of my night? two pictures. Yeah. So this is um, this is NGC two nine zero three. It's a barred spiral in Western Leo. And if you were hey. in this galaxy looking back at the Milky Way, this is probably what you would see. That's awesome. So, you know, barred spiral, two arms. There's even some spurs off the, yeah. you know, some yeah. of the arms, just like the Milky Way has just some like us. spurs. So if there's anybody out there, hi, when you get this message 35 million later, years later. So. We're your twin. What's up? Oh, we're space <laughs> twinkies. Doppelgangers. <laughs> That's the great thing about this is that we can't necessarily see what our galaxy would look like, but we can see other galaxies that right. look like our galaxy, and so and we, it yeah. is like we're looking at our twin. And we have an idea of what our galaxy looks like from looking at the inside using, um, you know, mapping the arms. We know we're in a disk. You can go outside at a dark site and see that because you see that band of light yeah. uh, across the sky, and you can see, you can use other wavelengths to probe that disc and actually see how many arms the Milky Way has, and so you can use yeah. radio and infrared to do, to do that. Uh, but no one knows what. Yeah, we haven't got we haven't got anything nearly close to far enough away to photograph yeah. it. No. no, yeah, no, New no. Horizons, not even remotely. Yeah. No, Voyager One, no, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, well, you did a great job with your one of your. Let's see the other picture, Thad. Do you have the other one too? Yes. Um, it, it's a MySpace picture of him going like this. Because <laughs> you, because you actually like nearly, uh, um, actually still processing the other one. Oh, Okay, all right. You almost yeah. lost some fingers to frost, frostbite in uh, so, the cold. Uh, Joshua, I, I can post it afterwards after right, I get it right. okay. cleaned up and all. So, well, for for our final image, I don't know, if, Stuart, if you've got one more queued up, but I'm gonna go to Bill's view here, and this looks like the uh, California nebula. Uh, California nebula, yes. California. <laughs> That and does look like California. Just, it does, and you're located just at the top of this, right? Just above the top. Well, of this yeah, area. so about about a half a field, maybe up to the above this. Yeah. <laughs> um, Love yeah. your field of view, Bill. Yeah, it's really. about uh, what three by two and a half degrees, something like that. Yeah, and this I one's take, actually cropped, so I gotta take like three shots to get it. Mm -hmm. Now, are are you using a 500 millimeter lens on a camera body or a 500 millimeter telescope? 500 millimeter Takahashi uh, with the okay. camera in the back. You wouldn't get that flat a field with a with a camera lens because I I didn't think so, but I went yeah. Yeah, he has your favorite telescope, Pamela. No, I want to tell of you. He has a Takahashi. Oh, you want to tell of you, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And just for mm -hmm. another one, since I've got it ready, ET cluster. Cool. What? The ET cluster, like pho like phone home. Yeah, oh. like phone home. Oh, I don't get it. God, I've, oh, I haven't seen that movie in so long. I know. That one was happening? before the two of you were born. Yeah. But I watched it, as yeah, it so many times. We were the only death. Oh, forget that. We were playing the Atari Twenty Six Hundred game. What was that, Gary? I said we set an ugly precedent last week. Yeah, it's just gonna keep going. <laughs> and, and, and Thad, you mentioned the Atari game that was horrible. Oh yeah, I hated that Atari game. Isn't that was there a landfill in New Mexico where they just buried like like 
hundreds of thousands of copies of that game or something? Yeah, I don't know. They <laughs> so, that oh, each really? Atari yeah. game was the worst. Okay, well, we are now completely note, nonlinear. Yeah, on that note, why don't we wrap this up? We, I'm uh, still not seeing people, why it's the ET. No, I don't know. I'm sure someone... It, it looks like a bug. Google it. Yeah, yeah, it does look like a bug. Google it. Thanks yeah. for yeah. Let me Google that for you. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna, we're going to wrap this up. So, Bill, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful final view of the uh, the ET cluster. No problem. That's fantastic, and thanks for all the other images. That was great. And there's David. We get to see David with his hey. red light of doom. Oh, yeah, I got the hopefully I want we'll headlight get, going on. Hopefully we'll get Stuart's headlight, too. <laughs> Aww. Yeah, and thanks, Gary, for coming. Sorry about your okay. terrible uh, skies, but it uh, is what it usually is. it's, uh, yeah, usually it's so safe, and you're, Yeah. Uh, and this, so there's Nicole. Thank you very much, Nicole, for joining Idiot. us. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Pamela, we're going to see you tomorrow when we do our live episode of Astronomy Cast talking about failed stars and big in Jupiters. 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. That's great. Scott Lewis, thank you very much. And thank thanks you, for running the show last week. It was yeah. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did what I can to to be constantly professional at all times. He was the only professional yeah. one there. Yeah, I think consummate professionalism is the way I would describe last week's star party. You, you, you know, when Scott when the parents are away, the kids are going to take over. And no, Scott was very professional. So he was. It was, it was the professional. rest of you. Well, I just saw that go online a few days ago. Half of the professionalism is wrangling you lot. So. <laughs> yeah, I do that on Fridays. I That's true. Fridays, you're too new to fly. All right, Stuart. Thank you, Martin. Where's your Where's Evil Stuart? There he is. <laughs> evil Stuart. <laughs> oh, you're anything but evil. <laughs> and Thad, thank you very much. All right, well, this is the Virtual Star Party uh, signing out. We'll see you all next Sunday night right here on Google Plus. All right, bye, everybody. everybody. All right. Bye. Bye.